Okay, the title of my article, Between a Hard Rock and Postmodernism, refers to a particular site, a particular place, the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. I've decided I'm going to do this through audio so that you can pay more attention to the colorful slides that I'm going to present here. Have you been to a Hard Rock restaurant? Why did you visit it? Uh, you may have just wanted to see it. Uh, it's a brand, a theme restaurant. I'm not sure they're so special anymore. I think they've become more passe. But part of what I was really enthralled with when I initially went to Las Vegas as a student was how different that experience was from my experiences in other places. In particular, I saw indicators of a different form of thinking about images and themes. Uh, like Jean Baudrillard theorized, signs only mean themselves in tourist Las Vegas. They really become untethered to any sense of original meaning. Las Vegas for Baudrillard is hyper-real, but Baudrillard doesn't really go into great depth as to how they're hyper-real. I want to examine one place closely to see indicators of this hyper-reality and of a postmodern moment. One aspect of postmodernism is a changing view of commodities, things that are bought and sold. We've talked about it before. So like the clothes you have on, all the items you buy, the material of everyday life, uh, anything that can appear in a market is a commodity. And Las Vegas doesn't produce much material stuff. It is a tourist-based economy. And so what I argue I saw there was the commodification of things previously uncommodified, or perhaps better said, less commodified, than elsewhere. Uh, it's phrasing that's a little fancy. It ultimately means, though, that things are bought and sold that are ephemeral and somewhat intangible. Uh, they come and go. And they don't have a clear use value or exchange value, but like Baudrillard discussed, they have a sign value. In Las Vegas, you see these gigantic hotels with 5,000 plus rooms, some of the largest hotels on earth. And people go because they want to experience something. So the commodification of things in Las Vegas really is about the commodification of experience. That's why people go there, to have a different exciting experience in this place and it promises fun and adventure. The rush of gambling, the pleasure of fine dining, you take in a show, get all dressed up, you go to the clubs, um, and this is part of what you see today as the commodification of sentiment and feelings. So as an example, uh, if you ever go to a summer blockbuster movie, uh, you go to experience something, to see something that's engaging, it's evocative, makes you feel. Um, summer blockbusters are like an emotional roller coaster ride. They'll show these epic battles between good and evil, uh, a lot of explosions and car chases, iconic scenes, crashes, things that you could see in uh, superhero type films, uh, frenetically moving around, a dynamic soundtrack, explosions like I said, and that ex it creates a, a sense of sensory overload. And again, these are kind of crucial features of contemporary postmodern life, uh, this marketing and selling of things that are uh, ephemeral and image-based designed to create feelings. The images of the guitars I'm showing you here in the previous slide. Uh, the other guitar here is of the uh, for the Hard Rock Cafe, which is on the same property as the Hard Rock Casino in Las Vegas. Uh, but these are the things that I describe walking toward in the article. Some people think they're the most readable parts of the article, the more personal descriptions, uh, like the one with the subheading, Getting In. I was walking from my house, my apartment in Las Vegas, toward these huge neon guitars. And you see things in Las Vegas that are quite different from the things you'd see in Kearney or Omaha. Uh, things like huge, massive neon signs that are designed to get your attention and create a, a strong feeling or a sense of awe or interest. One of the things about these neon signs and the colored lights that have always been associated with Las Vegas is they make use of a technique that you could say is 
long been associated with getting people's attention. For tens of thousands of years, people have been attracted to dramatic changes of color visible in things like sunsets. People often say they love to watch a sunset and changing light and color in the sky. Uh, it's supposed to be breathtaking and inspiring. So I'd say that in Las Vegas they've tapped into this kind of human attraction to strong light and color and magical juxtapositions in order to help sell things. Uh, you see magical things in the photos. It's uh, dusk in the previous photo, the sun setting, and uh, Las Vegas is supposed to really pop or be very colorful uh, around dusk when you start to see those lights go on. So you see the place that drew me in and how I describe it, that there's a Fender Stratocaster in the previous photo that's about two stories tall and I say 75 percent erection. It's a type of le neon landmark that's mandatory for the site of a hotel in Las Vegas. It gets people in the door and it's phallic and it uh, is also reminiscent of this photo here which is the Gibson guitar. Again it's on the Hard Rock Cafe property which is a little separate from uh, the Hard Rock Hotel and the strings light up and if you ever get to see it they they strum, they vibrate from one side to the other when you walk by. There's a quote I have from Tom Wolfe in the article from 45 years ago where he's describing the strip. It's roughly to quote, such colors, all the electrochemical pastels of Florida literate, uh, tangerine, broiling magenta, livid pink, incardine, fuchsia, demure, congo ruby, methyl green, viridine, aquamarine, uh, and then a bunch of words that I can't even pronounce. Uh, but what Wolf is trying to do is poetically describe what he's seeing, trying to find phrases that can evoke these kinds of colors. And then I talk about walking in the door and the design of the space and how it's very carefully chosen. Every part is themed around the Hard Rock logo and brand. Uh, the door handle you see here is even in the shape of a flying V guitar bearing the Hard Rock logo. And nothing is accidental. These designs are not cheap and they're very well thought out. They're part of an entire experience and themed environment that they're trying to sell you, trying to get you to connect with and be part of. There's a phrase also I use in the article, hyper-differentiation, which is when you have products that are all pretty much the same on some level, but they're made to appear more different than they are. Uh, the producers are trying to over-exaggerate their differences by some type of special thematic quality. So like for example, uh, if you need a bottle of shampoo, you might go to Walmart, you find that they have a lot of different shampoos, but that they're actually really the same and that they can all help you wash your hair. The hyper differentiation is where these otherwise similar products are given some type of different color, a slightly different smell, or a brand that has a, uh, a, a been a, shown in a specific and memorable ad campaign. So the ad campaigns can be used to make you remember the product and sell the product to you, make it stand out from other shampoos, even though it isn't that unique. So co hotel and casinos are similarly themed in order to really appear different in Las Vegas. The whole space of the Hard Rock Hotel, I argue, is hyper-differentiated from all kinds of other gaming establishments and themes in the city. Uh, it emphasizes rock and roll music and a certain type of aesthetic or experience. Perhaps personal experiences in your own life can be related to the memories you might have connected to music. We talked about this once before. I used music as an example uh, when we talked about symbolic interaction. Uh, the meaning of songs can change over time. You've heard a song once that you had a strong emotion connected with at one point, but if you hear it a hundred times, you might lose that strong emotion. So, as it says in this um, postcard from the casino, uh, in this space that's the world's only rock and roll hotel and casino, uh, you have display cases with outfits worn by musicians like Prince, Sheryl Crow, Elvis, uh, 
things like the gold painted chandelier you can see at the top of the photo that's made out of saxophones and they're supposed to connect you with certain artists that you like or things that you might realize were really cool at one point. Um, there's a circle bar you see in the dead center of the image which uh, has uh, a dome that rotates and changes colors that's a little like a sunset. Um, so different things that are supposed to evoke feelings in this space. It's a themed space that's designed to encourage gambling and sell hotel rooms, uh, but it's also designed to sell products. And a lot of my article discusses irony. Uh, I point out that their logo is Save the Planet. Uh, but if you go to their gift shop, you look around at other things they're marketing with their logo, you see that it's connected to branding uh, and products that you don't necessarily need. It's promoting consumerism, and that's diametrically opposed to the message of save the planet. Uh, in this instance, it's use up the planet, destroy the planet, consume. Uh, do you really need multicolored socks with flames on them or boxer shorts with guitars, and musical notes, or any of the other products that you see sold in their gift shop? Part of what I focus on is different kinds of slot machines that I encounter within the space and the images that they display. So here's the Jimi Hendrix machine, uh, which has now been replaced. They don't have them anymore. But uh, Jimi Hendrix, of course, was a musician, a famous guitarist uh, in the 1960s, and he died in the early 70s at the age of 27. You see the quarter slot here on the machine. Uh, it's pretty funny because actually now they pretty much only take paper money today. There's a close-up of the quarter slot. Um, it's a lot harder to empty machines that take quarters because uh, they're heavy and the machines with quarters break more frequently. So you see this slot where you're supposed to insert your bills. It says also to uh, insert card here. It's in the upper right hand corner. And that's a slot for a player's club card. That's a whole different way of helping make uh, machines make the money in Las Vegas. You're supposed to join a player's club and that if you do that, uh, the, mach the machine is going to encourage you probably to play longer than you originally planned to play uh, because you suddenly see uh, this idea of points and you are encouraged to want to earn points. So you earn points through the more you play. So like for example, say if you come in with $20, you say I'm just going to spend 20 bucks uh, on these machines. If you join a player's club card, you're encouraged to, to get rewards and you might put in the $20 bill. After you play your 20, you find that you've earned 60 points, but if you get to 75 points, you might get $2 in free play. So you might then play more money in order to get more points. So your original plan then changes. And I argue that the entire space of a resort casino is designed to undermine the way you usually think about money, and it promotes their goal to separate you from your money. That's occurring throughout Las Vegas. Here's an image of Luxor. Obviously, you can see it's a massive Egyptian themed pyramid shaped resort casino. Um, it's designed to reproduce the pyramids of Egypt. Funny enough, you see all those hieroglyphics on display on the obelisk at the front there. Uh, they actually hired an Egyptologist to come in and make sure that the hieroglyphs there didn't say anything offensive or provocative to anyone in case anybody happens to be able to read hieroglyphs. Otherwise, the spaces are probably more evocative really than authentic. Uh, they reference an iconic city, or in this case, some structures. Uh, the pyramid-shaped building in the background you see is made out of glass. It's new, it's modern. The light at the top of the structure it, in the dark can shine uh, for miles into the sky. You can read a newspaper at like 2,000 feet uh, using the light from the top of the casino. The light serves as a center point in Las Vegas at night for orienting yourself geographically, so it's another way of attracting people to that 
particular casino. So Las Vegas is really, I think, a, an environment that's in constant competition to get your attention. And it's designed to inspire you to come and spend. Caesar's Palace, and the next slide is going to evoke themes of Rome and classical statues. And here is Caesar's Palace. Uh, it's obviously evoking uh, Rome, and I believe you can see the same statue that's pictured here, the Wings of Victory, in the hallway of the Fine Arts Building at UNK, if you ever stop by that building. In Caesar's Palace, you also see things like gladiators in costume and an area called the Form Shops, and they display Greek and Roman architecture in a rather confusing bizarre way because they they juxtapose them um, inappropriately it's it's a little bit convoluted the Excalibur hotel in this picture exhibits a different kind of theme it's almost like a Disney-esque medieval theme and they have things like jousting tournaments slot machines card games related to knights and princesses and other medieval themes. But again, you can see how massive uh, those towers are that uh, have the rooms on the right and the left. I believe that these days around 13 of the world's 15 largest hotels are in the city of Las Vegas. Here's the front of the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. And you get a little bit of the dimension and size uh, of the building if you contrast it to the cars, but it's very far in the background, so maybe you don't. Anyway, it's over 5,000 rooms there. And in Las Vegas itself, you have over 130,000 hotel rooms available on any given night. Uh, so it's an incredible number. The city has about 35 to 37 million visitors per year and they had to change the entryway uh, there. You see the big uh, metallic lion in the front. Uh, the former entryway used to be in the shape of a lion, uh, lion's head, and the doors were basically the lion's mouth. But apparently in some Asian cultures, uh, I believe it's Chinese culture in particular, that it's a very bad idea to walk into the mouth of a lion. Uh, so MGM wanted business from Asian customers and so they completely reconfigured uh, the entryway. Uh, so you can see superstitions and cultural logic uh, infused with building design. Um, they completely destroyed and rebuilt that entry which was a massive expense. Um, otherwise the um, theme of their building is largely Hollywood and MGM, uh, a major movie studio in the last century. This is a model for New York, New York Resort Casino before it was built. And you can see the Manhattan skyline there, along with uh, the red line being the roller coaster that you could take around the property. And so you not only have the experience of the skyline, but you can experience it in a completely different way than you would in Manhattan by whizzing by and through some of these iconic buildings. Uh, also there you see this very, very tiny little people, so it gives you a sense of proportion there at the bottom. And you see the Statue of Liberty there in the center at the bottom, and it's surrounded by water and a little tiny lake. Uh, it's, of course, the symbol of America and the American dream and the idea that you can come to this country and uh, make it if you work hard and try hard enough, which again is a, an irony about Las Vegas, which is all about hitting the jackpot, winning it big not necessarily working hard at all to make it to the uh, American dream. So the Statue of Liberty again, and this is what the New York, New York actually looks like, uh, something after the, the model uh, was built. It's um, something where this is a little bit bizarre, but after 9-11, uh, people began coming to the statue 
which is surrounded by a little lake you can't really see. But they began leaving uh, t-shirts from fire departments uh, and notes to the victims of 9-11 and the firefighters who lost their lives. So these are particularly evocative examples of Baudrillard's idea of simulation and simulacrum. Uh, it's fundamentally bizarre. This structure really has nothing to do with the real New York City, but people thought that they ought to leave objects and notes for the people who died in a sort of a tribute in the copy of the actual city. So again, you could see a lot of hyper-modernity, post-modernity um, in various aspects of Las Vegas. There are a lot of fantastic temporal uh, juxtapositions in Las Vegas. You can travel from one era to another within the span of a block. You just walk from one urban or world historic icon to another. And I argue that in some ways the city seems to be trying to reproduce the entire world for tourists uh, with one in uh, one easy to access space, right? So you don't have to worry about terrorism or getting shots or getting passports. You can go from Paris to what you see here, the interior of uh, New York City around uh, Greenwich Village and uh, the Christopher Street subway station sign and the facade of an apartment building. It's a strange kind of a thing, but people often seem to confuse the spaces. Uh, there was an article that ran about the opening of the Paris Hotel and Casino where someone said, I've always wanted to go to Paris, so now I've been to Paris, when in fact they had just seen the Paris Hotel and Casino. Uh, so again, the, the confusion and hyper-reality is apparent. You can find other themed resorts, some of which are fantasy themes, like Treasure Island here, a structure that's kind of more passe, I guess, these days, actually. Uh, but they are trying to retool it. They call it TI now and change the facade a little. And um, another thing about these buildings is they're designed to be changeable, malleable. Uh, they can be destroyed and replaced. I wrote a different article called Intersubjective Implosions, and in that I discussed the idea that the buildings that were designed initially to last hundreds of years in the city uh, are now being regularly replaced, imploded, uh, and it seems to be another hallmark of our postmodern throwaway culture. You also see the um, idea of planned obsolescence in buildings that can be imploded and destroyed. Here's another space, uh, the inside of a space uh, which was uh, the Aladdin, and that was where Elvis got married to Priscilla Presley, uh, but now it's been changed to Planet Hollywood, and this place uh, has been completely redesigned. But funny enough, at the time I did this article, uh, it had uh, an indoor shopping mall with Arabic designs and architectural facades, and you see up above the painted blue sky of the ceiling. So again, uh, the confusion between time and space and the trying to uh, create fantasy-type environments. Uh, in this particular uh, mall-type space, they can change the color of the sky depending on how much they dim or brighten the lights. So people will go through cycles of a day, seemingly every 20 minutes. And uh, at one point in the mall there, they had a sprinkler installed on the ceiling which would create rain, artificial rain and lightning flashes, so they've got their own climate, apparently, uh, that you can experience within a desert. And here's the Bellagio, which is really bizarre in that they've constructed a fake Italian village in the middle of the Las Vegas Strip, and it's complete with a lake uh, that's a reference to Lake Como in Italy which is where George Clooney often goes. I believe he has some property on that lake. Um, on the lake itself, they have dancing uh, water fountains that play along with music, and it's a popular draw for tourists to see and maybe allows them to 
want to go into the casino. All the shops, by the way, around here at the base are facades for shops that you'd uh, see as uh, selling designer products, very high-end type things. Here is the nearby Venetian Hotel and Casino, modeled after Venice, Italy. And if you go to the Venetian on the second story, you'll see canals and you can have gondola rides. Just think about that for a minute, okay? On the second story of that building, that's where they have the water for gondola rides. Underneath of that is the casino and the gaming area. Here you see a gondolier on his gondola in one of the canals in the Venice, or I should say the Venetian Hotel and Casino. Um, so the whole thing again designed to replicate an experience of being in Venice, Italy. You see the facades of the building and you see the again painted sky above. Um, again keep in mind this is all on the second floor of a building and um, you can see how it's a, a fascinating draw, an iconic set of uh, statues, images, buildings, um, a, a built environment that's supposed to bring people in and then hopefully they spend money, shop, and play a little bit. Paris Resort and Casino is within two blocks of uh, the Venetian and so the point I'm, I'm trying to make with these photos is that it's a big business. Uh, drawing a lot of people, um, Las Vegas itself, uh, it costs a lot of money to make these things. And there's an incredible competition between resorts for creating the right kinds of themes that will attract tourists, draw them in, and hopefully make them spend. So across the street uh, from Paris, one block north is Caesar's Palace. It's rather jarring and fragmented, all the different kinds of icons and images in this particular um, city and it really screams postmodern and uh, hypermodern in spirit. This is an interior mall in the Paris Resort and Casino and you can see the floor is designed to appear and feel like a cobblestone street. So a lot of the details you see again, uh, they've taken into account many things. Uh, the idea of promoting a pleasurable engagement in a fantasy, creating suspended disbelief, and um, again, selling you a, a feeling, uh, an experience. You go to Las Vegas for a few days, you see a lot of weird things, you gamble, you eat, um, and it's its own unique commercial environment. The Hard Rock Hotel and Casino basically takes rock and rollers, especially rock and rollers uh, that I found to die prematurely, uh, who embodied the idea of a romantic image of an artist uh, as a person who experiences a lot of pain and angst. And it commodifies those images, all right, so that now people pay a quarter or a buck at a time to have a new Jimi Hendrix experience uh, where they're playing a machine. So here you see Hendrix burning a guitar. It's a very famous photo from Monterey. Uh, I think it was shot in 1967, evoking the theme again of an artist who is engaged in art that is the destruction of him or herself. Uh, you can see it in very different ways throughout the images of people like Hendrix, uh, Sid Vicious, I'll show you in a second, and uh, Kurt Cobain. Here is an Anarchy in Vegas slot machine which shows a deceased Sid Vicious playing bass. He was the bassist for the Sex Pistols. Um, in the article I note that artists like Yukio Mishima uh, discuss beauty through the act of its destruction. And I quote the lines of Edna St. Vincent Millay, My candle burns at both its ends, it will not last the night, 
but ah, my foes and oh, my friends, it gives a lovely light. So in these machines, you can see the destruction of the artist is perhaps the artist's greatest art. On the Anarchy in Vegas machine that you see here, Sid Vicious, like I said, is playing bass and he's got a chain padlocked around his neck. Uh, the punk movement was a musical movement that was rooted in working class rebellion of young British men and women in the 1970s. And here it's been reduced to an icon, an image of a slot machine that's rather bizarre uh, if you think about it. Uh, is anarchy in Las Vegas playing a slot machine? Several of these images sell you the thrill of some kind of connection to an icon or type of music or a musical movement. And again, I talk a lot about how these are ironies that are found throughout the hard rock. The symbolism here is the anarchy in Vegas part is supposed to be cut up letters, so punks used uh, cut up letters in order to make new kinds of signs that were against the dominant culture at the time. You can see a picture of the queen there on the right and uh, the foul mouthed Yobbs headline. Uh, so punks were supposed to take things and juxtapose them in weird ways, like they'd take a safety pin and poke it through the cheek as a way of saying we don't buy into your culture. Um, there's nothing for us in England these days. We have a very high unemployment rate for young people. We're going to create our own music and subculture critiquing all this. Uh, so in the right you see the filth and the fury, uh, the idea that these are people who are out of control, a young people's movement that's a threat. And now that whole thing has been repackaged, commodified as a slot machine in Las Vegas. Kurt Cobain is another part of the ironic spectacle. In this case, he represents a different musical movement, grunge, and a different generation, so another niche market that the casino might appeal to. He killed himself with a shotgun blast to the head, and so you have this rather large image of his head behind headless mannequins, and that poster has a quote from him that says, I hate myself and I want to die. Here's a copy of the poster separated out from the display case. At the base of this rather macabre display case is some material like uh, the newspaper here with his suicide note and messages that you can read that people have left for him, uh, money, perhaps a little like the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Some people feel like they can connect with his spirit, apparently, uh, or honor him in this place that he had nothing to do with, but does present some of his clothes on headless mannequins and musical instruments that he touched. Again, I think in some ways this is a perfect example of how signs have been completely decoupled from their meaning. Uh, who are these notes left to and why are they left here? Why do people feel that they're making some type of connection uh, or statement when they leave them in this uh, showcase? It seemed like um, a fundamental confusion of uh, signs and what they signify, uh, the real uh, and the fantastic and the hyper-reality of the city. Here again you can see the slot machine and I should note it accepts dollars in all denominations you can see on the right. Uh, throughout tourist Las Vegas money is separated from the meaning that it has for people usually outside of Las Vegas. Uh, take as an example in the real world you, know, you might look for bargains, you might even compare the cost of things like a can of tuna fish at a store. What will save you a few pennies, this brand or that brand? Uh, in Las Vegas, that logic goes out the window. 
uh, spending money, you could say, becomes like a, a sacrifice. Uh, there's a search for a feeling, uh, a feeling of winning or losing or just participating, being in that place, uh, but a search for a strong feeling. And so maybe uh, anarchy in Vegas is treating your money like it doesn't matter. Or conversely, uh, maybe money does matter and there's something pleasurable about getting rid of it, losing it, destroying it, uh, like Jimmy is doing in the picture, burning up stuff that he values the most, in this case his guitar. Um, so uh, the symbol of a dollar, you know, however many dollars it takes to have a rich experience in Las Vegas, and the sign of a dollar and its in some ways, uh, very much relative uh, value and meaninglessness uh, in certain contexts. Remember how many of the theorists that we've discussed this semester have talked about money as an abstract way of assigning value, uh, as a symbol that changes social relations, and as something that can take people out of time and space. Um, so the relationship between this sign of money and all the other parts of a person's life uh, may again be decoupled in this context. I always felt like in Las Vegas spending money helped make you part of the spectacle and all of the different dimensions of it. And so part of the pleasure of spending money might be things like pulling the slot machine with this Fender guitar neck that you see in front of you. Um, the funny thing is is that most of these have been replaced now. Uh, the casinos instead want you to push those buttons you see on the front of the machine because they help you spend money a lot faster. The more you play over time, the more statistically you're likely to lose. Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols is quoted over this entryway and the quote is the only notes that matter come in wads. So there it is. Money and music are conflated. In rock and roll, uh, you can say music and money go together. The stars make the most money, and they sell the most, and it's a mark of artistic value and success. Then you see another statement over another entryway that completely contradicts Johnny Rotten's sentiment. Um, it's Prince, uh, you can tell by that symbol there uh, on the right, that says you don't have to be rich to be my girl, you don't have to be cool to rule my world. So uh, which of these statements are we supposed to believe? Uh, does money matter or not? So in a casino it, it does and it doesn't. Uh, the relative value of money is strongly influenced by that casino environment that is designed to get you to change your mind about its everyday meaning. These photos, this one and the next one, are part of a bar that had a portion of a church uh, as its decor, but uh, that ultimately uh, was something the church, local church protested about, and the Hard Rock decided to remove that. So some symbols have sacred meaning still. You remember Durkheim talked about the sacred and the profane. Um, in this case, a sacred meaning that was profaned, and the Hard Rock management, I imagine, didn't want to alienate its Catholic patrons, so it subsequently removed this piece. Here you can see how the image was changed to a generic picture of a Cadillac and eventually that's been replaced with banks of large television screens. In the article I also discuss a young man that I met while standing in line to enter the casino and I discuss his friend. The young man was dressed fashionably and was selected to be part of the audience for the opening concert. I use the example of his selection to note how advertisement today links the product to a particular image and that promotes a sense of identity and the notion of a lifestyle that's reinforced by associating with a particular brand. 
A t-shirt with a polo logo, for example, has a different value, sends a different message than one that does not. The thing is, though, that none of the images on TV that this young man who's now in the audience being shown around the world, uh, none of the images that are being presented are really real. They're edited, they're shown in ways that are designed to market things, to sell. So the images are what Baudrillard called simulacrum. They're all copies without an original reference. In this economy based on tourism, image, gambling, so much of what you see is simulated. And it's simulated in the hard rock here uh, through simulations of charity and of environmental concern. Uh, there was once this bank of machines that promoted saving the rainforest. If you played those machines, some of that money went to a fund uh, toward the cause of saving the rainforest. Uh, and tote boards over the machines usually show how the jackpot's rising. In this case, the tote board here shows the acreage of the rainforest that's diminishing by the minute. But again, this seems like an ironic or insincere attempt at saving the rainforest because the amount of energy that it takes to air condition places like the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino is probably far more consequential to the future of the rainforest than that drop in the bucket of a few bucks that's collected by a bank of slot machines. Yet, some people still play and again, uh, a form of hyper-differentiation, an appeal to maybe environmentally concerned people or people who think they're doing good. The gift shop, on the other hand, sells things with that Save the Planet logo, like these baseballs. The concern for the environment really isn't apparent in the gift shop with, again, all the things that are branded. The Hard Rock brand you can see on perfumes, wines, glasses, shampoos, all kinds of knickknacks that tourists like to buy. In conclusion, I argue that the postmodern theories that we've discussed, like those of Baudrillard, should be evaluated empirically through an ethnography of a postmodern space like the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. We need to communicate the interpretations and the meanings of such places critically to generate meaningful dialogue, the kind that Habermas suggests we have. Then we can ask things like, how do such places exhibit evidence of a new historic moment? And what is it that might be good or bad about that moment?